Montana State University. Gary used to be at K-State, but he went to Montana State, and there Michael Taylor, who's in our department now, met him, and he directed her to K-State, so I'll let Michael come up and introduce Gary. Be nice. That's the third warning this morning for me to be nice to Gary. Uh, Rich is correct. I met Gary when I started at Montana State as an undergrad, and he was a teacher for both my husband and I in the undergrad program, and also served as my major advisor for my master's program. And I can say, first of all, that we're very lucky to have Gary here this morning. Um, two reasons. One, it's before 10 a.m., and two, it's shaping up to be a really good weather day, and I've never known him to pass up golf for work. So we're just very fortunate to have him here. Uh, Gary is one of those people who, he's a very charismatic person, and he influenced me quite a bit when it came to which direction I was going to go and going on to grad school and things like that. And so, you know, I wanted to take this opportunity to just share with you a couple of the things that were the most impactful for me, things about him that, that really influenced me. And one was, um, I wrote him down here, one was uh, his, his humble nature, his wisdom beyond his years, his prowess on the basketball court. Oh, wait, sorry, wrong notes. Oh, here we go. Gary is very good at taking complex economic theory and conveying it to everybody. And he drug me along when I was in my master's program to a meeting of the Montana sugar beet growers and gave me the opportunity to speak in front of that group. And I watched him make that presentation and then I followed up and gave some preliminary results from my thesis. And, you know, I was just, I thought, I really want to do that. I really want to be that good at being able to convey stuff. And, and after I was done with the presentation, I came down and I, you know, he said, oh, you did a good job. Um, but one piece of advice, don't talk like a girl. And was, what do you mean? He's like, well, you talk too softly and too high of a pitch. You're going to have to change that if you're going to be, you know, an extension economist. Okay, so I don't know if I've achieved that or not, but I do want to say thank you for being here today, Gary. I think you'll enjoy the talk this morning, and without further harassment, please help me welcome Dr. Gary Brester. Thanks, Michael. Um, that was very kind words. Uh, uh, we are, as a native of Montana and former student, we're uh, in Montana State very proud of of your accomplishments over the years and uh, uh, want to note that uh, it's great to be back here at Kansas State University. Um, when, I, when I left in 1997, <clears throat> it was the hardest decision I ever had to make because I loved it here so much. Um, it was family oriented and it was the right thing to do, but uh, it's just great to be back amongst a, a group of friends again and, and back at this great institution. I also want to mention that uh, this is a very unique department, the Department of Agricultural Economics at, at Kansas State University. And it's unique for a number of reasons, but in particular because of the support that you folks provide that particular department. Being at these things, understanding that faculty matter, um, the, the purpose and mission at, at Kansas State University, is why I was attracted to it initially, has always been a focus by this faculty on teaching the next generation first. And secondly, creating new knowledge through research. And then thirdly, focusing on the agriculture industry, whether it's input supply all the way to consumers and international trade. Now, you would think that, that would be the norm at colleges of agriculture, wouldn't you? That, it seemed re reasonable, but uh, today, with lack of leadership and a number of other things, it's not the norm. It's turning into the exception. So you folks have a treasure here. You're very lucky to have the kinds of people and the leadership you've had. Uh, I'll just mention not just the faculty who are here, but all the friends I have in the department. And, and this started with Mark Johnson and then Dan Bernardo as department heads, now presidents of major universities, which is quite impressive, of course. And then through Dave Lambert and Sean Fox and, and, and now Alan Featherstone, that leadership is really, really important. So as they say in New Zealand, uh, good on you, mate. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I hope you appreciate the, the group that you have here. Um, I, uh, uh, I do want to note one other thing before I start uh, uh, through my talk. Um, my friends here sitting around, uh, they know occasionally I might stand on a soapbox on some issues, like I just did. 
uh, and Michael voice, uh, Michael's t voice. So there's a few. So, but but I've decided late in my career now that when I teach, which is what I hope to be doing here today, and if I'm going to be standing on a soapbox, my students should know that. That's fair. Okay. So I bring one now. Uh, I was standing on that one, and so we, we. I might. I might need it again. So we'll we'll just put that right here. So that so you know when I'm on a soapbox versus actually teaching economics. Um, I, uh, uh, I wanted to uh, walk through uh, some things about um, the cattle cycle. Michael asked if I could think about drought, and I have been thinking about drought, the cattle cycle, and a number of other things uh, for some time. So let me give you the summary here, and then I'm going to try to convince you that my conclusions about the cattle cycle, which is not very different at all than Glenn's, and in fact it matches Glenn's quite closely. Uh, the story is this, um, uh, at least since the Civil War, 1867, we have data back that far, we've seen increases in cattle numbers in response to higher cattle prices. It, it, completely rational, profit-maximizing supply responses. When, when prices go up, people would like more of that stuff to sell. And markets work in that sense, in that that's exactly what we want. Either we need more of the product, or we, have too much, we don't have enough of that product. That, that's the technical economic jargon. We either need more stuff or want more stuff. And in order to get more stuff, producers have to produce it. So, so I'm done with the economic jargon. Um, and, and, and that's always happened. Okay? And it takes a little while because of biology, and you don't get cows immediately. It takes a few years as a lag, but it eventually has happened forever. And a few years ago, and that, that's, the, that's the cattle cycle, that's the idea. And so we should have, by now, I'm going to show you the numbers, have increased cattle supplies substantially if the cattle cycle is going to behave like it has since the Civil War. And we haven't. A few years ago, Jim Minnert, many of you, of course, know Jim. Uh, he said, I don't think there's a cattle cycle around anymore. And at the time, I said, Jim, I just think you're wrong. Look, look, whenever we have big prices and profits, it attracts entry. It invites entry. A few years ago, when the price of corn got to $5 and then $6, my brother up in Montana became a corn farmer. He knows how to do it. Okay, he, 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 he started raising irrigated corn uh, in Montana. And that's the kind of supply response we expect from markets. But it hasn't quite happened yet in this last 20 years of the cattle cycle. And I want to try to describe why I don't think it's going to happen to a big enough extent for us to return to the long run average price of cows. That's crazy. What do you mean? You don't think we're going to... I'm going to try to convince you that we're going to see higher prices for a long time. So let me, let me get started and see if we can do that. To begin with, I want to think about the cattle market fundamentals, and I want to think about a, a little bigger picture of, of world beef production. Uh, back in 1980 or so, the world produced about 43 million metric tons of beef, and it's been an upward trend in beef production uh, over the last 30 years or whatever I have up there. And the question then becomes, is this trend looking like the green line? Does the green line represent the trend in uh, overall production? Because if it is, we, we would just keep shooting up and we'll eventually have a, a lot more beef on the market. Or is the trend more like this, uh, uh, what color is that? Pink, fuchsia, something, I don't know what that is. Anyway, uh, uh, is the trend going to be somewhat flatter? And I happen to think, for a number of reasons, we will certainly see increases in beef production worldwide, but I also think it's going to be a little flatter or a little slower rise over time. Uh, if you think about beef cattle numbers uh, in the world, um, uh, starting in about 1980 or so, when most countries started reporting, we had a little over a billion head of cattle, got as high as 1.1 billion head of cattle. Uh, in, uh, as an inventory in the world. Um, that's just a data anomaly, the, drip, the drop there, unless everybody in China had the tax assessor come around at the same time and they ran them all down in the coolie and didn't get them counted. But I think a couple of countries forgot to report. You don't lose uh, 100 million head of cattle. But in the end, we're now under a billion head quite substantially, uh, worldwide cattle numbers, uh, 975 uh, a million head of cattle. So cattle numbers have, have declined uh, over the last uh, uh, decade or two decades around the world, not just in the U.S. As I mentioned, uh, the cattle cycle can, could, can be uh, characterized, uh, and this is data back to 1867, as about every 10 or 12 years, uh, 8 years, something like that, there's a peak and a peak showing up or a trough 
and a trough showing up. And we see that, 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 that cyclical process all the way up into the mid-1970s. And since that time, since that peak time, we start seeing those uh, uh, cattle cycle numbers continue to cycle, at least for two more cycles, but on a downward trend. So animal numbers were trending upward, but a cycle around them, and then trending down. But my main uh, issue of, of, of concern or, or, or of research lately has been this time period since about that 1993-94. Um, it's clear that there are cycles, and to me, at least visually, it's less clear that there's been a cycle since that time. Now, one response might be, well, that we just haven't had good enough profitability and prices to encourage production. That, that's not really true either. Now, it is interesting to think not just about cattle numbers, but to include the production of meat that we get from those. Because in the end, cattle numbers are basically a proxy for how much beef we're going to produce. This is the same inventory graph, the brownish looking line up there, just starting since 1972. So inventory is on the right side of that graph, uh, numbers of head. Today, January 1, inventory was just under 90 million head. Okay, that's finally an increase, as Glennon mentioned, through because of heifer retention. That's an increase of the previous year, but that's the first increase we've had in four or five years. The green line represents beef production from that cattle herd. That is, abstracting from any beef we bring in, or even live cattle we bring into the U.S. These are numbers I've been putting together over the years to say, how productive has our cow herd been? our own U.S. cow herd. And the green line's following the brown line pretty closely on the left side of this graph. That is, let's see, I'm a columnist, I'm a PhD, I'm really smart. When you have more cattle, you get more beef. I, 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 it, 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 it comes naturally to me, these sorts of relationships. You, know, you get more cattle, you get more beef. You see that up there, throw, and then, then you have fewer cattle, you get less beef, and you get more cattle. And then you sort of see this in the early 1980s, uh, still some relationship between those two, certainly, but not nearly as closely related. We actually are getting about, until last year, about the same amount of beef from 90 million head of cattle, roughly, uh, as we did from 130 million head of cattle. Huge changes in productivity in this industry. One way to think about that productivity change is to consider the pounds of carcass weight beef that we get per U.S. beef breeding cow annually. On the left side over there in the 1970s, we take all the beef produced from the domestic herd and divide it by the number of beef cows. Okay? And over here on the left side, you can see we were somewhere around 500 pounds of carcass weight beef from each beef breeding cow. Uh, that, was our, that was the productivity in the 1970s. And today, we're much closer to 700 pounds in terms of carcass weight beef produced per beef breeding cow. And that's a number of things have changed. We certainly have bigger cows, bigger animals. But also, we have fewer open cows. The percentage of cows that are open is much smaller today. We have better genetics. We have better herd management. We have better grazing management. We have better feed management, more health and animal nutrition management. All of those things have combined to increase the productivity of this sector. And I like this picture as a, as a measure of that productivity change. But at some point, again, I've got a PhD, at some point you still got to have hooves on the ground. I think we'll continue to see upward trends in this. I, every time someone has said productivity and technological change is flattened out and stopped forever, they've always been wrong. Okay? We'll continue. But I don't think the productivity changes are going to be enough to make up for that very low number of 90 million head of cattle and calves that we saw uh, this past January. If we're going to see big increases in supply, that's what's going to be necessary to get calf prices lower. We're at this $2 range for calf prices and above. Um, we would need four to five million head of, ca of cows added to the beef supply in order to get numbers back, enough production out there to get prices of calves back down to their long run trend. And I'm gonna to try to convince you, I don't think we're gonna get there, I really don't. Um, here's a, a picture of, of cattle prices uh, over the years since 1970. These are annual averages. I've got two numbers up there. I've got the Nebraska Direct 1113 weight choice steers. That's in the brown line. Uh, this is in dollars that occurred in that year. So I call it nominal. Uh, meaning I haven't adjusted these numbers for inflation. I'll come back and do that in just a second. 
Back in the 19, and this is Montana uh, five to six weight steer calves. It turns out that if I didn't have a long series of Kansas calf prices, but I had them back to 2000, these numbers are so highly correlated that it doesn't matter whether I'm talking about Montana steer calf prices or, or Kansas steer calf prices. Back in 1970, and none of you are old enough to remember this, I understand that. But back in 1970, when you took a steer calf uh, or a fed animal uh, to a market, uh, you got about $35, 100 weight for that animal, $35, $40. Uh, and today, last year, we were, with calves, we were uh, up over $250 uh, per 100 weight. So there's two things about this graph important. Certainly, there's been this upward trend. Okay. The two things is, is that in 1997, when I went to Montana State University, there was, especially in the fall of that year, cattle prices were really low. Calf prices hit about $70 a hundred weight steer calves uh, in, in Montana. And there was a small producer group that got started, and they pretty much blamed me for that low price. Okay. Now, I can take the hit. That's okay. But I want some credit for this high one then. You know, if I cause the low one, I certainly should get some credit for taking these high prices. So that's number one. Number two, when I did this talk over the years and show these prices to ranchers, uh, I, this was sometime in 2000 or 2003, I was giving this talk, and, and a rancher in the back raised his hand and said, young man, I want to point something out to you. I was young then. <laughs> uh, and, and he said, you know, I see these, you, you've got these prices a lot higher today. It was 2001 uh, than they were back here in 1980. He said, but I want to tell you a little story. He said, back in 1980, I could take five steer calves to the auction market, five calves in the auction market, get the proceeds from those calves, go to my GM dealer, 1982, go to my GM de dealer and buy a brand new pickup. And this was now in 2000. He said, and today, when I take five steer calves to the auction yard, get the proceeds, go to my GM dealer, I can still buy a 1982 pickup. <laughs> well, there's certainly some, 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 some truth to that. In other words, costs rise too. So if we consider inflationary impacts that cause all prices to rise over time and deflate that out, that's what I've done in this graph. The same two uh, sets of numbers, steer calf prices, fed cattle prices, deflated into today's dollars. Meaning what? Meaning back there in 1970, that $35, $40, 100 weight, in today's dollars, if you would have been in today's value of the dollars, would have been somewhere around $150, 100 weight. And you notice that we have this sort of, except for a couple of spikes, which I'm going to come back to, You've got this long downward trend from 1970 into almost 2000 in inflation-adjusted prices for cattle. And by the way, that's true for every commodity, including oil, actually, if you look at a long enough period of time. Commodities' uh, 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 prices decline over time because of technological change. They decline because of, of, of productivity. And if demand isn't there to pick up all the extra technological change and increase in productivity, real prices are going to decline. In fact, if you think it's bad for these industries like agriculture uh, and cattle, think about some other industries where we've seen huge declines in commodity prices. Uh, computers, incredibly cheap today, right? Let me give you another example. Calculators. Okay. When I started college in uh, 1976 at Montana State University, the only people, the only students that had a calculator were the engineers. They had holsters. And they had these Texas Instruments calculators that were this long. And they said, you right? Anybody here? They slid them in there, and that's all they had. And none of us had calculators. You know why? Because they cost $150 in 1976. That, that, they, the only, they, they really needed them, so they paid for them, and nobody else did. Now, let's contrast that. Calculators are a commodity. Eventually, technological change, entry, calculators are a commodity. Let me give you this example. Here's a calculator. How many of you have a little brother? Okay, calculators are so cheap today that my little brother gave me this one. And he's a banker. All right, so uh, this is not that unusual. However, what is unusual is since about 2000, 98, whatever, these inflation adjusted prices have clearly been trending upwards. And, and that should be the impetus for increased cattle numbers and increased beef production. And, and the story here then is, uh, ha why hasn't that happened to date? And then of course, uh, especially for uh, those that are cattle producers and then those who are lenders are wondering, will that eventually happen? 
From the demand side, Glenn did an excellent job yesterday of, of explaining that demand for uh, beef has actually been very, has been relatively strong and has actually increased over the last couple of years. Um, uh, the, the, the issue is, I've had a lot of producers say, well, you know, but per capita consumption, a lot of analysts have said, but per capita consumption is lower. Well, it has to be. We used to have 30 billion pounds to spread over 330 million people and then exports. Today, we have maybe 25, 26 billion pounds. Per capita consumption has to be lower. The issue is, is it lower because there's less to go around, or is it lower because people don't want as much? And what we're seeing is people are paying a lot. Glenn showed us yesterday. People continue to pay for beef. We have less consumption. Price is allocating. Some folks don't consume as much beef. Some folks are, are consuming none as a result of higher prices. But in the end, price is that allocation mechanism. So if we're consuming less beef simply because prices are higher, that's OK. If we're consuming less beef because people don't want it, that's the real problem, which occurred probably throughout the 1980s and, and into the 1990s. So price is the allocation mechanism, and we have very solid demand. Um, foreign demand is certainly increasing as well. Um, the recent negotiations uh, with the, uh, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership will be a real good boost to the U.S. cattle industry. If Japan reduces their tariffs from 36% right now down to zero, that is another positive thing for the U.S. beef industry. Certainly increasing incomes around the world um, and increasing populations bode well for the beef industry. Uh, and the pork industry and the poultry industry as well. As many developing country incomes allow people to switch from uh, protein-based, uh, uh, plant-based protein sources into animal-based protein sources, it happens as incomes rise. But all of this really is a pretty slow phenomenon that you really don't have a lot of influence on uh, as a particular industry. We can develop better products and more consistent products, certainly. Uh, but in addition to that, much of this is income-based and has very little to do with what an industry can do to influence it. Um, the real story here, and this is back to Michael's question about sort of drought and, and, and cattle responses, involves the supply side of the market, the production side of the market. If demand stays as solid as it is, if we don't have any sort of disease scares or anything like that, um, we're going to have very solid demand for this product for a long time. Increasing incomes, increasing foreign uh, demand, that sort of thing. So the story comes back to supply side. If we see a lot more increase, a big increase in cattle numbers, then we're going to see large increases in production. That will cause prices to decline, and that's the question that so many people have. My question is, why hasn't that happened yet? Now, certainly, supply has declined over the last 10 years, 15 years, even in the face of relatively high prices. So this is a slide I probably spend the most time talking about. And there are several things going on in the industry that leads me to believe that we're not going to have large increases in cattle numbers, enough to offset the reduced production we've had to date. And the first one of those, uh, under, under the cost side, I think costs have increased in this industry more so than in other sectors of the agriculture commodity. Uh, 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 community, uh, and drought being one of those really big ones. And not just drought recently. Back in about 20 years ago, uh, we had a major drought in Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado, cow-calf country. And then we, uh, years later, a few years later, major drought in the southeast. Again, many cows in the southeast. Missouri and Kentucky went through a drought about 10 years ago. More recently, the southern plains, the southwest, certainly has been uh, devastated with drought. Uh, and now, even though some of these places noted yesterday are certainly improving, we now have California, Washington State, and Oregon. I was on Eastern Oregon a couple years ago with uh, some of the CHS uh, nutrition people giving some talks, and around the Pendleton area, big cow-calf country, it was really dry. I saw my buddy that I was out there with just uh, a couple of months ago, and I said, how are things out in Eastern Oregon? He said, you know how bad it was when you were out there? I said, yeah. He goes, it's worse now. Canada is experiencing much of the same sort of problems in their cow-calf country. So if we don't have grass, you're just not going to put more cows out there. It's just not going to happen. So drought certainly is not just recent, but has been sort of floating around uh, the country over the last several uh, 20 years or so. And yesterday, Dr. Taylor mentioned some of these things. The other cost factor when I talk to cow-calf producers are feed costs. 
Now, while more, many cow-calf producers certainly aren't going to produce a lot of corn, and corn has been quite high price over the last several years, the feed cost we're talking about here is forage. Um, alfalfa hay prices in the U.S. have averaged over $200 a ton uh, over the last two years. Other hay is somewhere near 150 or 175. Um, last year, in, we, we harvested a million acres less hay a year, uh, relative to a year ago. So we're down a million acres. 300,000 acres of alfalfa hay was not produced last year in California because of water restrictions. They took that water and put it on their vineyard crops and their tree crops and that sort of thing. That's seven ton to an acre in, in, in California when they can water. So we've, we've had these uh, pulls away from forage production. Even higher spring wheat prices and corn prices have hurt forage production to some extent, and feed costs are another element that have risen, and I don't see them coming down very much in the future. A third cost that has changed has been grazing availability, not just because of drought, but because of land use issues as well. I might have to have the soapbox pretty closer. I, mean, I don't think so. I think I'm okay. Um, the, the issue here is, is there anywhere in the U.S., and by the way, the rest of the world, much of the rest of the world, like the EU-28, for example, is there anywhere in the U.S. that you've heard where the Forest Service, the BLM, uh, or state-owned uh, uh, land, where those managers of those lands have said, bring more cattle out? We, we want to increase AUMs here. Bring, put more animal units out on that property. It hasn't been happening. It's been going the other way. We haven't seen anybody say we want less wilderness areas where we wouldn't have cattle. We, we want more. I'm not going to be pejorative here. That's what society is saying they want. They want fewer cattle on these places, or they want no cattle out on some of that open range. Big issues out west. And so none of these have helped improve the availability of grazing. And I'll add one more thing. We, can, we always like to pick on people in Montana, Colorado especially as, as well, those that buy the trophy ranches, you know? They, they build a 40,000 square foot home, they've got a lot of land. And, and those trophy ranches usually are bought, uh, it's a generalization, but they're often bought because people want the solitude, they want the hunting, they, they want those sorts of things. And then they find out if there's no cows out there, the hunting's not very good because the grass grows too tall, it doesn't seed out, we have wildfires, and so they eventually restock these places. When I talk to the managers in both Colorado and Montana of some of these ranches, they say they stock them at about 50% of the commercial rate. That is, when they finally put cows back out, because even rich people like the money, they're rich, right? Uh, when, when they finally put those cows back out, they stock at about a 50% rate. Uh, that, that's a loss of grazing availability. We used to stock twice that number of cows in some of those properties. Now, before anybody gets all excited, I don't think any one of those things are any a big deal. You know, I don't, I don't think any one of those is causing huge losses, but none of them have helped us develop or use more grass. They've all been a negative drain on grazing resources. Uh, and then, then I think maybe the most important factor, in addition to drought, is labor costs. There's no question that the cost of labor rises in a developed economy where standards of living continue to rise. I know as a producer, you hate paying dollars out for labor, right? Um, uh, but, but it actually is a good... If you want cheap labor, go ranch in know, South Sudan, Eastern Ukraine. You've got plenty of cheap labor there. You know, in, in developed economies where standards of living are rising, labor costs are going to rise. I always thought that the, the, how many here are old enough remember the Maytag repairman commercials? You know, the loneliest job in the world. Remember those? I think the loneliest job for a government bureaucrat today is the immigration officer in North Korea. Who wants in there? Dennis Rodman. And then they don't keep him. You know, it, it, look, there's, it, do you know Pyongyang, they now have a new time zone for the capital of North Korea? And it's 30 minutes off of their other time zone. It's a half an hour off. Makes sense. You have a dictator that's a half a bubble off, right? So they actually have a new time zone in the capital. It's 30 minutes off of the rest of the country. I wonder why we don't want to be in North Korea. Uh, labor costs rise. And what do people do when labor, producers do when labor costs rise? You figure out ways to economize on labor. Use less of the relatively more expensive input. Uh, in crop farming, um, one way to use less of an expensive input is to send them off to be a college professor. 
or throw them off the farm or semantics. I don't know. But 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 you use less people. When the day I left uh, uh, or was thrown off or whatever uh, uh, from our farm, we used to we raised sugar beets, as, as I think Michael mentioned. Or it's in the, it's in the bio. And and we had six row beet equipment, so that was twelve row twelve feet wide. About two feet in between each row. And we had six rows. So you'd plant them, then you'd cull them in back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And six rows. The day I left the farm, they went to 12 row equipment, which is not only twice as fast, it's more than twice as fast because you don't have to turn as many times. Well, that takes a lot of time on every end. So they're more. Than, and I asked my dad, I said, Dad, why didn't you do them when I was home? He said, Because you were home. He said, I know where you were every day, going up and down, up and down, up and down. I said, you can't get in much trouble doing that. He said, you'd have just had free time on your hand. That, that's a capital for labor. So what do we do in the modern world today now? We have uh, wider equipment, much wider equipment. Well, you still need a, a person to run the combine, but we're not running combines with 18 and 20 foot heads. We're running with 36 and 40 foot heads. That's a capital for labor substitution. Um, actually, is, even GPS technologies is another way of substituting P, uh, machinery for people. I know for a fact that with GPS, a college professor can plant sugar beets in the dark, dead straight. I asked my brother why he made me do that. He said, well, he said, I'm thinking that if I can teach a college professor how to do this, he's got a hunch he can train a monkey to do it as well. So that, that's his cow. He's trying to find a labor substitution there, and I'm, I'm sort of the, uh, the guinea pig uh, between me and the monkey doing this stuff. It's more, my point here is even in the cattle industry, we figure out ways to use less labor. We have better fencing equipment. We have better squeeze shoes. We have better four wheelers rather than horses in many cases. All of those kinds of things help. But it's much easier to switch from using labor in, in, in using less, to use less labor in the crop side than it is on the live. Livestock production is more labor intensive. So one of the ways to use less labor is not to have the cows around anymore. That's a labor-saving device, and we're seeing more and more of that in many places where we had traditionally lots of cattle out. Eastern Montana is a classic example. Lots of cattle out in between those fields, those dryland fields. They were, they were eating the, the stubble. They were, they were in the coolies. You know, they, and mostly, I think, it was because we had a lot of kids around then, and they needed to stay busy, sort of like me on the six-row beat equipment. And we see less of that today, and these labor costs continue to rise, and I believe that that's one of the major factors in causing fewer animals to be produced, even though we have higher prices for those animals today. The second part of decline in supply, I believe, has been alternative production factors. There's no question that crop profitability has been very strong over the last decade or so. So here I have a, a, a situation where my crop profitability from farming crops is very strong. And if I have labor costs and all these other costs going on, do I really need the cows? Now, uh, one of the uh, things I also wanted to mention on that side is the crop insurance. You know, crop insurance, where's our arts out here? I know crop insurance gets blamed for everything. So I, I cannot, I, I, can't, I can't let it go. I just have to do this. Um, but in all seriousness, um, a couple, uh, just a month ago, Rabobank analysts uh, came out with a story uh, of research on the cattle industry. And they said, we're going to increase cattle production back to the levels we were before. And their argument was, we're going to do some retention now to replace animals in the drought-stricken areas, especially the southwest. So the animals are gone, grass comes back, we'll need more animals to put there. I believe all of that. But they said, if we're going to get back to the numbers that drive calf prices back to their long-run average, we're going to have to see substantial increases in cows in non-traditional cow areas like the upper Midwest, the I states, for example. And their argument is, is that producers will do this to diversify their selection of enterprises. Now, we diver diversification of enterprises is a way to manage income risk. You know, the old days of, of hog farmer feeders, you know, with corn and, and hog, that is a diversification strategy. And that can reduce income risk. Or, and I'm not certain of the number, 96% of the five major crops in the U.S. is covered either by yield or revenue insurance today. So either I can manage my income risk by diversifying and pulling calves at 3 in the morning when it's 20 below out, or... I can write a crop insurance check and do the same thing. And I think increasingly you're seeing people say, this is a less risky and less costly way 
to man. Quite frankly, I don't think Rabobank bank analysts have it right. I don't think there's any interest at all in adding cows to an operation for a diversification strategy. It might be for a profitability strategy. I'm not saying that. But as diversification, it's not necessary crop insurance. Finally, I'm going to talk about age. Take a look at the census of agriculture. The average age of farmers continue to increase. We know that for a fact. Um, Pat Goggins runs Pays Livestock Auction in, in Montana. That's their, the major livestock auction there. And when he has a bull sale the last several years, he has said one of the major characteristics that bull buyers are looking for, they ask him about every time, is how gentle is this bull? And he said it's because older people just can't get out of the way anymore. You know, I've been chased by a bull, okay? I, can't, I got a new hip last December. I'm not going to get out of the way of that anymore. I've been chased by the cows. I can't get out of the way of them anymore. I have yet to be chased by a combine. It doesn't happen. I drive my brother's new combine this last, this last summer, and, and you get up off the seat, the combine shuts down. You know, where's the switches? I've got to get that fixed. You, you can't even get off these things. So th the point is, is that uh, age has something to do then with our ability to do many things. And in this case, I think it has a factor in why we're not seeing expansion in cow-calf country. And I believe there's some structural factor. I think Ted Schroeder and I have talked about this years ago. I think you're seeing much like, uh, uh, back in the 1960s and 70s, in the agricultural economics journals, there was as many articles about the hog cycle as there was about the cattle cycle. People trying to understand these. And we don't see anything about the hog cycle anymore because there isn't one. Why? Because you have people that raise hogs and raise corn. Now they might do both, but they're going to do both or they're going to do one or they're going to do the other. They're not raising hogs and then not raising hogs and then raising hogs. The industries demand for consistency and lower costs have meant we have structures in place where if you're going to be raising hogs, the pens are there and you're going to put hogs in there all the time. I mean, there's, there's opportunities to not to go lower or higher, but not much. And I think we're heading the same way in the cattle industry. I think we're going to have people that say, I have 1,200 cows and that's our business model and we've had a structural change because of costs, because of consistency, quality, all those sorts of things that happen to the hog business. I think we're going to see happen, uh, continue to occur. I think it's occurring now and will continue to occur. Meaning, I think we're going to have more full-time producers that produce cattle and fewer part-time. And you've already seen that in the, in the cattle herd size. A few years ago, the average cow herd size was only 25 in the U.S. Now it's up over 40. I think it's closing in on 50. Doesn't sound like a lot. That's a huge structural change when it comes from thinking about a full-time versus a part-time producer. So I think we've seen that. And the final point I want to make came from a rancher. I was giving this talk one time a couple years ago as I was developing my thoughts on this issue. And uh, a ran real nice guy in the back of the room raised his hand. He said, Gary, B wasn't up there then. Okay? He said, you do realize that if we were going to expand cows, we put more cows out there, that we do have a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, well, you do realize that today, relative to even 15 years ago, cows are much bigger. 200 pounds bigger, 300 pounds bigger. That, the average cow is much bigger than it was back then. And he said, larger cows take more grass. And I went, I knew that. Now it's up here, okay? But it never occurred to me. That's right. Before, I could put 1.5 cows out there on that new grass that I had or improved past or whatever, per, a per acre, whatever it might be. And now I can't put as number of cows out. Now they all produce more. I understand that. But his point is well taken. We might be using all the grass we already have, and expansion is going to be very difficult unless we pull cropland out of, of corn, wheat, uh, uh, alfalfa production, and move it more towards uh, some sort of improved pasture situation. So I, I think all of these things have, have occurred. If you think worldwide, I want to show you one quick story here about maybe elsewhere in the world we'll see cattle numbers rise, world production go up, and yes, we have a different product, I know that, but in the end, more beef on the market will soften the prices for all beef products, including our high quality ones. I've got two pieces of information up here. Um, the, the blue line is measuring production in 2014 from each of these major uh, 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 cow uh, areas, uh, countries. Um, uh, the blue line shows millions of metric tons on the far right-hand axis. So let's look at the United States, way over on the right. We produced about I don't know, a little over 11 million metric tons of beef uh, in 2014. 
The red bar, then, that's being superimposed over, represents the inventory of cattle and calves at the start of that year. So that production came essentially from those animals. Okay? If you look at the red bar, the, the, the axis is on the far left-hand side. So for the U.S., that, uh, that doesn't quite work, I guess. Uh, we have about 90 million head, and they produced 11 million metric tons. Okay? Now, let's take a look at some other countries. Um, let's take a look at the EU-28. Very similar size, a little over 90 million head. They produced, oh, 7 million uh, metric tons, something like that. Um, you look at, uh, at China, also very similar in terms of total cattle numbers. They produced a little less than the EU-28 did. Brazil. 220, 10, 210 million head of cattle and calves. Uh, they still, with 210, almost two and a half times the number of animals that we have, they still couldn't produce as much beef as we do from our much, much smaller herds. So these are measures of productivity. United States incredibly productive because we feed these animals grain more than anything else, but also genetics and property rights and contract law, law and order, all those sorts of things combine to allow for that sort of productivity. Um, who else is similarly productive? Well, actually Canada is. Um, Argentina is not. Argent uh, Australia is not. Uh, India. India has uh, 320 million head of cattle. They only produced about 4 million metric tons of beef. Now, of course, the cattle in India are not there for beef production. They're dual purpose animals, draft animals, uh, uh, dairy animals, uh, uh, religious sort of things keep a lot of that beef from being produced. But they produce some and it's exported to other countries. Why do I make this point? Well, in the world, if you take a look at where cattle numbers have risen, Okay? There's only two major countries where it's happened in the last, since 1999, we can go back further if we wanted to. It's been in India and Brazil. Yet both of those countries have very low productivity. So if that's going to be the source of more beef, they got to really increase cattle numbers to get enough beef on the market to have a substantial negative effect. Actually, cattle numbers in uh, uh, China continue to decline, uh, and, and imports into China, exports, our exports, or other exports into China are starting to rise. We don't, aren't technically allowed to export to China. I think some gets in there. Uh oh, some might get in there, maybe, maybe through Australia or New Zealand, I'm just saying, but that, 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 that's not for the general public. I, I was on the soapbox, so that doesn't count. Uh, but if you look at the most productive countries, our cattle numbers continue to decline. And even Argentina, pretty flat. Um, Australia, very flat. Canada, uh, declining. Uh, none of this bodes well, is what I'm saying, for a lot of increased production. So, my last topic. Let's think about the long term. Um, uh, we certainly are starting to retain more heifers. Uh, I believe a lot of that will end up on the southwestern and hopefully eastern Oregon, eastern Washington uh, pastures as those places recover from drought, we certainly can hope. But I always like to, to think uh, philosophically about some of these things, so I frequently invoke um, a variety of philosophers into my talks. The great American philosopher I want to talk about today is Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra has a number of sayings that are really great. For example, uh, no one goes to that restaurant anymore. It's too crowded. That's from Yogi Berra. Uh, the, 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 one, the one I like from him is at one time he said, it's deja vu all over again. And my question is, is that true in the long-term look at the U.S. cattle industry? Is it deja vu all over again? So, how do I want to think about this? Well, as I mentioned, if demand's not impacted by some sort of disease or recession or something like that, then beef prices are going to depend upon the supply side. Okay, that's my premise here. It turns out that we have seen these record prices three times previous in the history of the United States. Okay, now let me explain this a little bit. This is back to that picture I said I was going to show you. Inflation adjusted cattle prices in 2014 dollars. Okay, well, I showed it before. Now, let me explain to you a little bit of how college professors work. First of all, college professors know how to spell, usually, and work is a four letter word, so you got to start that. Uh, so I come into work about 9.30 ish. Okay, and, 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 then, and then of course you have to have a, a, a double, triple latte from across the street, just a touch of froth on it, and a hint of cinnamon. Um, and, and, uh, and, then, and then then it's half of the morning nap. Okay, so eventually it's lunch. So I, I love my job. Uh, after lunch, though, there's kind of an hour before my afternoon nap where I actually try to do something. And so here's what I do. 
I look at this picture. Now, granted, sometimes when they walk past my office, I'm looking at this picture and my eyelids are closed. But, but there's a reason for that. If the data seeps through your eyelids, then you have found something. So I'm trying to see, I'm trying, I'm trying to think about this day, and can I, can I learn something? And one day I'm sitting in my computer with my eyes closed and waiting for the, and the data wasn't speaking to me. It wouldn't speak through my eyelids. And I, I thought, God, I gotta figure out a way to, to make this work. Um, so I decided to invoke the ideas and the thoughts of a, of a higher being. Um, I started thinking of Terry Kastens. Terry and I, Terry was a student in one of my classes and, and uh, colleague at Kansas State, and Terry and I published an article together that I don't think anybody else has ever read, but I like it. And uh, so I, I said, you know, maybe Terry can... Now, I didn't, now, don't get me wrong here. I didn't actually want to talk to Terry on the phone. You know him too? Yeah. <laughs> but I thought he could help me. So I started thinking about this data. I started thinking about Terry. I said, you know what? I don't really want to talk to him on the phone, but what I'm going to do is... I think he can help me if I just think about extending this data back in time. So this starts in 1970. I said, I wonder what happened if I'd look at a little longer period of time. And the reason that Terry's name came to mind is I decided to go back earlier in time, start the data earlier. And so I went back to the year that Terry was born, 1910. <laughs> if you go back to 1910, that's the longest I can get the data back, on calf prices in the US, uh, and then Take the dollars that calves sold for per hundred weight back in 1910 and put them into today's dollars, 2014 dollars. That's what the, the, the jagged brown line is representing here, going back in time to 1910. And then the green line across there is the average of all of those jagged 100 years of data there, or 105. It's the average of all those. That's the long run average price of calves. Uh, in, in today's dollars, about 139. And if you look at the, 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 the pink line, the dotted line there, that's the statistically fitted linear trend line to that data. So if we're, on, if we're at the average price of calves that we've seen since 1910, we'd have calf prices at about uh, uh, 139. If we were on the trend, it'd be about 151, 152, and we're well over $2 for this year as well. So three pieces of information. And once I got the data back far enough, that's when I started seeing something and it started speaking to me. What the heck happened in those three years that are the high peak points? What were those years and what were the circumstances that got us there? Because in 2014, and we'll see this in 2015 as well, we've got a very similar situation out here. If history repeats itself, what caused the spike to go up and what caused it to go down? That should help us for thinking about the long term. Well, those previous spi price spikes occurred in three years, 1951, 1973, and 1979. All of those had some similarities to the more recent price spike. We were, there were years of quite low cattle numbers. We would followed a liquidation phase because prices were low for a long time, and we got rid of cattle with very low numbers. And it was a start of herd expansion, as, as Glenn was talking about. Heifers that are retained don't go on the market. They don't produce beef that first year or the second year. And as a result, um, we were starting to really have limits on supplies. But since 1867, those situations were no different than any other cattle cycles we had. We had very similar situations. So for me, that can't explain those price spikes on their own. Well, let's explain it this way. In today's dollars, calf prices hit $243 in 1951. Um, why? Well, this was the beginning of the Korean War. This follows World War II, where we have all the terrible supply shortages, all the starvation and the nastiness. And there was very real concern by many countries that the Korean War was going to be World War III, except this time with China. And, and so lots of agriculture, not so much beef, but, but feedstuffs were being purchased and foodstuffs were being purchased by countries as a hedge against that very real possibility of severe starvation that could occur. Uh, and, and what happened? Well, fortunately, as terrible as the Korean War was, it didn't turn into World War III. And very shortly thereafter, by 1954, calf prices were way below their long run average of 139, below that, just three years later. If you think about 1973, 1973, we had another combination of weird events. We had President Nixon giving corn and wheat to Russia, and they never did pay us for it. 
Um, so, and that happened in that same year we had a really bad crop of all those commodities in the United States and around the world. Um, some protein did not show up. The Peruvian fish meal, which is used for animal source protein back then, very poor harvest. All of these factors came together. The beef sector was trying to expand. The hog sector had lost money. All these things. So we, we had this huge increase in, in a limited supply of, of meat proteins until the fall. And then OPEC quadrupled oil prices. For you young people in here, think about taking oil prices today and then quadrupling them. That's what it was like in the 1973. Uh, gas prices went way up. We know that beef is an income sensitive product because it's expensive. Expenditures are higher on beef than any other meat commodity. And people said, I gotta put gas in the car or I'm gonna or, or I'll eat a steak versus some piece of chicken. All right? And they didn't have money for the steak after putting gas in the car. Demand absolutely collapsed. These high prices were very short lived. By nineteen seventy five, two years later. Calf prices went from $240 a hundredweight, a record at the time, near record in real terms, down to $95 a hundredweight. Complete disaster. 1979. Oh man, here we go again. After that night, after those very low prices, 20 million head decline in the cattle inventory. Big reduction in cattle inventories. Not many numbers around. Herd rebuilding began. Back to Glenn. Herd rebuilding began. Low numbers. And the 79 OPEC oil shock doubled oil prices again. And the same loss of demand occurred. Rebuilding lasted a couple years. By 1982, we were down below the long run average price for calves again. Oof. Okay, let's think about this. Back to my picture. You can see the peak years. Those three peak years there, and the fourth one being in 2014. The blue dots show the year following the peak. That's the average price of calves, the year following the peak year. And the red triangles show two years following the peak year. All right? Now, take a look at 2014, the peak. It was $250, something like that. We're expecting something like the blue dot. At the end of the year, 2015, when you take a look at the price of calves across the United States, it's going to be something above $2, two and a quarter, I don't know. But it's going to be somewhere where that, la that fourth blue dot is. So now the question is, if history really does repeat itself, where should the triangle show up next? That is the third year, the first year, the second year after the peak. If it follows the last three record years, then it's going to be there, somewhere near 139, 140, 100 weight. Jeez, a couple of bankers just went, <gasps> you know. <laughs> if history would repeat itself. But remember, what caused those big declines in those first three triangles? It really was an expansion of the cattle herd. It was loss of demand. And so the question becomes, do we anticipate demand losses that big? Like what occurred after the Korean War did not become a world war, after the OPEC oil shock of 73, after the OPEC shock of 79, could something like that happen again? Sure. Do we think it is? Does anybody have an inclination that's going to happen? I don't think so. Uh, the only way that can happen is if we add on the supply side, four or five million hit. Go back to 2014, similar story. A 10% loss of inventory over the last seven years or so. US production is low. World production is pretty flat. Demand seems to be pretty solid. We had $255 a hundred weight in 2014, the average calf price. Do we expect any of that slide that I showed you, the supply side impacts that I think has caused this lack of expansion on that cow herd side. Do we think we're going to get more grass? Maybe. Do we think we're going to have less wilderness areas? Possibly. Do we think labor costs are going to decline? Maybe. Okay? No. Uh, do we think crop profitability is going to turn around? Possibly. I doubt it. Okay? Not long term. Uh, or do we think that the age of our producers are going to go down substantially enough that they can get out of the way of a, a, a mad mother cow or a bull? I don't think so. Will substantial herd rebuilding occur in the U.S.? I don't think it's going to occur because of Rabobank's argument that upper Midwest farmers will need to diversify their income. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, will it happen elsewhere? If not in the U.S., somewhere else. Maybe. But I will say that in a closing comment that Ted and I have talked about this over the years, and he told me, Gary, you are underestimating the 
willingness and the ability of U.S. producers to try to make money. That if the profits are there, they're going to expand, they're going to uh, take advantage of that, and he might well be right. I just don't think we have enough grass, and because of labor costs and specialization, I don't think we're going to get back to the long-term trend on, cattle, on calf prices for a very long time. Uh, and I don't think we're going to get there at all. Why? Supply side cost effects. So with that, I'm going to stop and have a few minutes. So Richard, you stay on, 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 on time here and see if I can answer any questions for you. Right here. Yeah. The, the question is, did the Nixon price freeze have a, an impact? Uh, absolutely. I mean, it just messed up markets so bad that, I, you know, I, if I, with your permission, I'm going to add that as, a, as if I can get another one of those bullet points up. The Nixon wage and price freeze has messed so many things up, including health care coverage, by the way. No, I don't need that. Uh, all those sorts of things. Uh, Made, made a huge mess of things. Yeah, it was, it was really bad. Yeah. I, I'm going to add that. Thank you. Very good question. I, 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 I have the, my final slide here, and I still want you to think about a question. Um, this, is, um, this is a picture of the prettiest ranch in the world. Um, how do I know that? Is it a subjective? No, it's not subjective. I actually have market data on this. This is uh, near Kayakura, the west coast of New Zealand on the South Island. Uh, uh, we were there with students uh, a year and a half ago, and this is on a ranch. John Murray owns a um, thousand head of Angus cattle. He has a breeding uh, operation there, uh, raises genetic, Angus genetics, sources some out of Montana, actually. Um, uh, and about 3,000 head of sheep. He runs it with two of his sons. That's looking down into a beautiful river valley. Up the other side is, take your pick of mountain ranges you love the most, Banff, Canmore, uh, 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 the Tetons, uh, the Rockies. Up that side, that's what you see. And when you turn this way, you see the rim, the, the horizon of the Pacific Ocean. And you hear the waves crashing against the, uh, the, the rocks. It's that close. So you've got the Monterey Peninsula, the Tetons, and this river valley. It's so pretty. That when we were leaving John's place, he, he gave us a wonderful tour. Um, we always try to give a gift to the, the, the hosts. Uh, somebody gave John a gift. And two of his boys worked this with him. Uh, and a, a girl named Carissa came up to me and said, Dr. Brestner, I said, what's that? She goes, I'm going to give this gift to uh, Scott, and one of the boys. And I said, that's fine, great. He goes, I think I'm going to slide a ring inside of, the, inside of the package for him. I said, why? She, well, I, 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 I'm going to propose to him. I said, Chris, that's okay, I guess. I don't, you know, that's your business. I said, but you know, there's a problem. She goes, what's that? I said, well, that boy's married and has two kids. She says, I'm okay with that. <laughs> that's a market revelation of how pretty this ranch is. Is there anything else I can answer for you? Right there, please. On your slide, you say that cows are bigger, but yet the Angus influence, compared to a similar situation, the Charlie. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the, the cow herds, uh, those, uh, you're right, some breeds have kept us from getting into that, but even that Angus breed is heavier by a couple hundred pounds. So, so yeah, even though the Angus influence has kept the, the, sort of that limousine size not becoming the norm, okay, but on average, those animals have gotten bigger. There's actually a little Holstein influence going on in there too, but no one wants to admit that, especially the Angus. Oh, sorry. All right, all right, all right. That's probably there. I'm on. The, that doesn't count. There, the media it doesn't count. Uh, but, but yeah. But on average, all those, even with the Angus influence, we still have bigger cows. Yeah. Attended a conference last year in Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. 
Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I, I think you. Uh, yeah. Sure. The, the, the comment is, is that profit maximization happens in a number of ways, not just having more pounds, right? It's the cost side as well. And certainly there are ranchers and ranches that are continuing, all ranchers, are trying to figure out how best to use that grass. It might be with a smaller animal. In some places in Montana, they have to be ranging. they got to be able to walk a long ways. So smaller animals with sometimes longer legs help. There's, that happens throughout. But if you look at the average cow size in the U.S., it has increased. So both because of some genetic things, not that everybody has, right? But we could see that. But remember, if we go to that smaller cow size, we aren't going to get as much beef per cow. That might be profitable. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that won't help put more beef on the market to the point. It, it, will, it won't help increase supply. It would actually do the opposite. But might be the right thing for many ranchers to do, no question. And, and they do, right? They, they make these adjustments all the time. The, the, biggest, the biggest fallacy we see in agricultural economics are those who believe that every farmer does it the same way, every rancher does it the same way. I can't find two that do anything alike. All right, That's exactly what you would expect. Those are usually things talked about by people that don't know what they're talking about. Next question. I'm not even going to stand on the soapbox for that because that's just true. One more, Rich. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your tolerance. I really enjoyed the invitation. Have a great conference. <laughs>